Good morning, church. I know that there are those of you out there who are just like me and can't wait for Christmas dinner. I know that there's those of you out there who are just as hungry as I am. So I will try, and key word in this phrase is try, to be as quickly and swiftly as possible. All right? So you have to follow me. You can't fall asleep on me because we're going to go through this. We're going to go through it quickly. Um, but uh, God willing, we will all understand and come to a better knowledge of our Creator and a better relationship with Him because of it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, O oh God Almighty, we ask, Lord, that this time, as we're about to dive into Your Word, dive into Your Scripture, teach us, Lord, to become more like You, to become a clear reflection of Jesus Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title of this morning of the sermon is uh, Too Big to Fail. Now, I'm sure there are some businessmen and businesswomen in church this morning who are familiar with this term, too big to fail. What is that? I'm sorry? Yes? Capitalism. What else? What else you got? Too big to fail. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Banks. Banks. What? Auto industry. Auto industry. Auto industry. Investors. Big economy. big economy. Someone said Trump over here. <laughs> uh huh. In- insurance companies. Uh, Medicare, Obamacare, what else we got this morning? We think too big to fail, what do you think of? Uh-huh, and, and is this a fact? Can something be, be too big to fail? Can it? Big corporations? What happened in 2008? Can it really be too big to fail? I feel like you guys did this on purpose this morning. You tried to limit me from walking around. That's okay, I can go around you. That's all right. Sorry, cameraman. Too big to fail. Many of us started out this year, 2016. Oh, this year's going to be great. Things are too good. Nothing's going to fail. My job is going great. My marriage is going awesome. My kids are growing up. My son is almost as handsome as I am. Things are too good. It's too big to fail. And somewhere along the way, there was a slip up. It was someone else's fault. But some way along the way, what seemed too big to fail, failed. And though today, and I don't mean to be, <laughs> I don't mean to bum you out this morning. I don't mean to burst your bubble this morning. Today, at the end of the year, where you started and you felt like it was too big of a year to fail, You have gone through multiple losses. Lost a a relationship, a boyfriend, a girlfriend. Lost a marriage. Lost your children. Had a death in a family, a grandparent, a grandmother, a son, a daughter, a father, a mother. Lost your job, your security. What seemed almost too big to fail, failed you. Perhaps you failed a few classes. And I feel like this is what the Jewish community was going through. God chose us. We, this plan is too big to fail.
This plan is too big to fail. God choosing us as a, as a, a nation is too big to fail. And this idea of this being too big to fail... Each time pulled them more and more into darkness and they were captured by Assyria, by Babylon, taken away, brought back, but still under the captivity of the Romans. And everything seemed too big to fail, but somewhere at the prescribed time, in a remote area of this world, in a family where people didn't give two cents for, A light of hope was lit. See, what seemed too big to fail wasn't what we do. It's not uh, us. It's not uh, how we go about our day. It's not about uh, the promises that we make ourselves. The only thing too big to fail in this world is God's plan of salvation. You don't believe that this morning. That's okay. I understand you're hungry. Now, in these last six months, um, we've been working with the youth. And and we've been uh, elaborating ideas. And we've been brainstorming. and, And we came up with a few words, a few Hebrew words that we really enjoyed. And we really wanted to share with our church, and that we really wanted to embody as a youth and young adult Christian community. And I don't know if you remember the first sermon was about Gala. Do you guys remember this word, Gala? And Gala is actually the name of our um, youth, young adult, our AY program that we have once a month here for sundown worship. And Gala, do you remember what Gala meant? It's okay, I'll remind you. You don't have to answer that question. Gala meant to be revealed, to open, to see. And we, and we prompted this word because we, we wanted for God to reveal himself to our youth. And through our youth, reveal himself to our church. But see, this word had a twofold meaning, and we went deeper into it. We realized that this word doesn't only mean reveal, but it also means when a land is revealed, henceforth, exiles. And we spoke about exiles, and we spoke about uh, uh, what exiles were supposed to do. And yes, they would be taken away, but God promised them, He was like, pray for your city, minister to your city, for in its peace, you will have peace. In this prosperity, you will have prosperity. Bro, I missed you. I'm so happy you're here, man. Um, in its prosperity, you will have prosperity. We spoke another, about another, another word, aman. And aman would be what we know as faith. In the New Testament, it's faith. In the Old Testament, it's trust. To trust God. And we brought this message that we have to trust God. And whatever it is that we're going through, we must trust God. And this morning, the word is Mashiach. Mashiach, I'm just going to say Messiah, is Messiah or Christ in the New Testament. And this word was the last word that we decided to do because it fell in December. And we're like, what's better than, you know, to speak about Jesus in December? And we came up with a sentence that we want to embody, that we want to proclaim as, as youth, and that we want to teach our congregation to proclaim as well. And it's, God reveals, God reveals himself to the exiles that trust in the Messiah. God reveals himself to the exiles that trust in the Messiah. Now, we chose the root words for a specific reason because that way we can just move them around and add things to them and then they can say, you know, this sentence. God reveals himself to the exiles 
who trust in the Messiah. God reveals himself to the exiles who trust in the Messiah. Hmm. I want to go with you to a very peculiar book, a very particular book this morning in Scripture, which uh, is a very long book. It's a very rich book. It's a beautiful book. The book of Psalms. Now, before we get into the book of Psalms, I want to tell you that Mashiach didn't always mean Christ. You know, the literal translation is anointed or anointing, depending on where and how it's used. And what it meant was that um, what you would do is you would literally take some oil and, you know, put it on someone and anoint them. And the people who would be anointed would be separated for a special purpose, for a special task. For a divinely appointed mission of of, of some kind, a job. And the people who are generally anointed were kings. You know, kings were very important in, in society. Kings were anointed. Priests were anointed. And prophets were anointed. Now, the Psalms talks a lot about this Messiah. It talks a lot about what, uh, uh, who, you know, to anoint and, and how to anoint and, 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 and why they were anointed. And it, it shows us that, you know, in this, in this hymnal of, of Scripture, because it's, it's literally a hymnal, guys. It's literally a bunch of songs that people wrote. That in this like Old Testament, ancient um, Israelite hymnal, you find this word reoccurring constantly. And now, you probably can't see this, but that's okay. Um, This slide is just to show you that I did my homework. There's a lot of stuff on there. I can read a couple for you. Um... Uh, uh, these are portrayals of Jesus Christ in the Psalms. And we find Jesus Christ as the Son of God in chapter 2, verse 7, as, a, uh, as someone who is praised by children, um, who is accused by false witnesses, who is hated without cause, who is a priest forever, uh, who is the chief uh, cornerstone of God's building, a bunch of things. I, I urge you, don't leave this morning's message just as is. I urge you, go home. See if what I'm saying is real. Okay? Try it. And I want to hear about it too. Maybe we can add more things to this sermon. Don't believe everything. Study it. And so you find that the Messiah is reoccurring in the Psalms. And the reason why we go to the Psalms is because I have a lot of youth in our church, if you didn't know, your, your son or your daughter is probably one of them, who, uh, who are known as, uh, as, uh, as hipsters, right? Do you guys know what hipsters are? All right, so the regular uh, 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 Christian you know, uh, Christmas service is, is going to give it to you in every angle, like Emmanuel and all these other things. Uh, but today, you know, we find that that's a little too mainstream. Right, Andrew? Where's Andrew? He's around here somewhere. There he is. Right? It's too mainstream. So we decided to go along with, with, with the Psalms. And what, what's so interesting about these Psalms? What's so interesting about, okay, yeah, Messiah anointing, um, it comes up very often. Um, when you go to the Psalms, we see in Psalm 2 that there are Psalms that are called Messianic Psalms. And in case you don't know what Messianic Psalms are, these are Psalms that point directly to Jesus, to the person of Christ. And these Messianic Psalms, uh, one of the, uh, a few of the most famous ones are Psalms 2 that talks about His coming reign. Uh, Psalms 22 that talk about His crucifixion. Psalm 16 that talk about His resurrection. And Psalms 110 which talk about... Um, this Messiah as a Savior at the right hand of God. All these point towards Jesus. 
Now, I want to give you guys an example before we move on. Make this a parenthesis within the sermon uh, so that you can follow me and we can, we can learn a little better because we learn a little better with examples, right? We like examples. So let's compare King David to Jesus Christ, shall we? We know who King David is, right? Yes, I'm not getting much reaction from you guys. You guys are a little sleepy. That's okay. Uh, King David versus Jesus Christ. And we find here in Psalms 6-8 what David says. Psalm 6-8. Let's go there. Let's go. Psalms 6-8. Follow me with your uh, Bibles, with your phones, with your iPads, with whatever it is that you have, uh, your disposition. If your son or daughter has it, take it away. Tell them this is more important. Um, Psalms chapter 6. And Psalms chapter 6 verse 8 says the following, Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. This is David speaking. You find the same thing in Matthew. Let's go to Matthew. Let's go to Matthew. First book of the New Testament. And we find it in Matthew chapter 7 verse 23. Matthew chapter 7 verse 23 And it says, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So it seems that like Jesus is echoing some of these psalms, some of these songs. We find here that David's experience was prophetically linked with the experience that Jesus would go through. And we have a few more examples of that. If these are all... Um, the numbers that you see there on the side are chapters and psalms. And these chapters of the psalms, or these psalms particularly, were written by David. And um, they deal with the suffering of the poor, with the unjust attacks of the righteous, with the idealization of justice. Justice is a huge theme for David, for Jesus. And the uh, portrait of the righteous man. Psalm chapter 1. It's a very good psalm. And, and what we find here. And, and, and this is a verse I like to stick out between David and Jesus. It's a following one. In Psalms chapter 7, verse 8. Psalms chapter 7, verse 8. This is very important. Listen, family. Psalms chapter 7, verse 8 says, The Lord shall judge the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity within me. This is David speaking. This is David speaking. And my question for you this morning, was David innocent? Was he innocent enough to say, Oh Lord, judge me according to my righteousness and according to the integrity within me? Now, you may make the argument, there's a lot of pastors here that, well, in the context in which the psalm is, you, know, you find that David is in fact innocent from that one thing that he's being accused of. But he's not completely innocent. This takes us to... Um, the, the priests and the Pharisees and the scribes and, and the Sadducees and all these people, all these people that were uh, devoted towards uh, the, the worship services, who were devoted towards the temple, they would study these scriptures. They would study, uh, you know, the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They, they, would, they would study um, the Psalms. They would study some of the prophets. They studied these things. And as they studied... They realized something. Well, to be a priest, I was anointed. And, you know, the kings were supposed to study these scriptures too. And the king says, well, to be a king, I was anointed. And the prophet, even the false prophet says, well, to be a prophet, I was anointed. But as they read these things, they realize that they can't live up to the expectation of this anointed person that Psalm speaks of. And they're scratching their heads and they're wondering, how am I supposed to live up to this? If I'm anointed and the person that this is talking about is anointed, how do I live up to this? How, am I perf how can I be perfect? How can I deliver these people? How can I bring salvation? And as they read on, they, they, they kept figuring out that this couldn't possibly be them because they can't possibly do what is being described. It's the first time, and probably one of the only times in Scripture, if not the only time in Scripture, where it appears that this Messiah 
is given as a title of a one man is in the book of Daniel. Go with me. The book of Daniel. Book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 24 to 26. I see some faces just staring off into book of Daniel, chapter 9. Yes, chapter 9, verse 24 to 25. Book of Daniel. I didn't put it on the slide, so you've got to look for it. If not, I can say whatever I want, and you guys are going to think that that's what Daniel says. Book of Daniel. All right. I see some studious people. I love this. Book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 24 through 26. Now I will go there. Book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 24 through 26, says the following. Oh, this is, this is beautiful. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. We've heard a lot about these 70 weeks. A lot. We heard so much that we forgot about them. For your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Ah, given to one person, the most holy. Who is this most holy? Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem till the Messiah, the anointed one, the prince, there shall be 70 weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off. Hmm, Who is it talking about? But not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, the end of it shall be with flood and still in the war desolations and have been determined. Um, it's the first time. Listen carefully. It's the first time. It hasn't happened before this. There was the illusion. There was the knowledge that perhaps it was talking about someone who is to come because it can't be me. And, and if you look at the language that David uses in these Psalms, he speaks his language and, and, and the the theologians say this, that the language that David uh, uses is the language of a king to come, not of himself. First time, the anointed one. So we, we, we figured this out. I'm almost done here. Can you believe that? Can I get an amen? Oh, now I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> David is not innocent. You're correct. Good job, family. David is not innocent. But there would be one whose innocence is absolute, has complete freedom from sin, and can be judged based on his righteousness alone. Who are we talking about, family? Who is this anointed one? Oh, you don't sound convinced. See, God revealed what he would endure, what he would be like, what he would do, how he would die, why he would die, and how much he loves us. He would reveal these things through the Psalms. He would reveal these things through the musicians. God will reveal himself through the songs of other people. How he loves us. And how this love, how his love is for us through these songs that these men wrote based on their experiences. Based on their experiences. The songs that they wrote based on the experiences were foreshadowing the experiences that Jesus would have. This is why this book is so important. Listen carefully. We're getting to, to our lesson this morning and, and, and we're about to finish here. Jesus would go through such experiences. And in essence, in essence, listen carefully, in essence, the Psalms that David and all these people wrote that foreshadow Jesus' experience, in essence, are the songs of Jesus himself. That's it. In essence, the Psalms 
are Jesus' songs. Today we live in a world where, um, you know, as soon as Thanksgiving is over, what's the first thing that comes on the radio? Deck the house. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We Sometimes I know some of those carols better than I know some hymns. It's true. These psalms. In this time where, 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 where songs are so popular. And this song that comes to mind, I don't know if you heard it, it's by Casting Crown. It says, Life, song, sing to you. Have you guys heard of that? Let my life song sing to you. No? I'm sorry for my pitch. The orchestra wasn't helping me either. I don't know why. Um, I'm just kidding, guys. What is your life song singing? In this upcoming year, it seems that in these last six months, the youth have introduced the theme for next year. And the theme for next year, Pastor Dan, am I allowed to say it? Is that okay? Is that, su- is that a surprise? Okay. Uh, the theme for next year is trusting God. And see that every time that we come up here and we say, we are one, Lord, make us one, Lord, right? And we think that it's just like this process that we go through and we just sing the same thing over and over again. But, but it has a significance because it just so happens that in these last six months we've been working towards something, to the introduction of something that we'll be doing next year. And it just so happens, family, you haven't noticed, the forefront is our youth. If you haven't noticed, I'm telling you that right now. And so this church is moving as one. Here's the big task this year. Perhaps in your mind you're already thinking next year is too big to fail. I hate to break it to you. But at some point, your idea of what this next year is going to be is going to fail you. What song will you sing? Will Jesus sing through your experience? Will Jesus' voice be heard through the way that you react towards these bad things that are happening to you? Will your life song preach? That's my prayer for you this morning, church. That in this next year, we may sing of a wonderful Savior. Of the coming Messiah. The Messiah that will come a second time, triumphant. A King. The King of all kings. Above all kings. Let us pray. God, my Father, God, our Father, everlasting God, You have spoken to us through Scripture so many times. Not only through Your prophets, not only through uh, the actions of kings, not only through um, the priests, but Lord, You have spoken to us through song. You have sang to us, Lord. And we are reluctant to hear so many things, but somehow your music comes in. And every time we read the Psalms, we rejoice in the Psalms. For we know that you are our salvation. You are our eternal rock. You are the chief cornerstone of God's building. You are what we can rely on. You are what gives us victory. You are what gives us success. You are, Lord, our Redeemer, who redeems us, who redeems this last year, this past year that has failed us, God, in you. We, We claim, Lord, that we will be successful, not necessarily in in physical things, but in spiritual things. For your kingdom is not of this world. God, help us. Help us 
to always look towards Jesus. Help us to realize that the experiences that we go through, whether good or bad, preach to others about who you are. Lord, give us the strength to sing a song of praise in difficult times. Give us the strength, God, to sing a song of praise in difficult times. Give us the strength, Lord, as exiles in the city of Orlando to trust in You in such a way that You reveal Yourself to us and Your revelation is known to this city. God, we ask these things. There's no power in us. We cannot be perfect without you. We cannot achieve the things which you set us out to achieve without you. So God, in this year, please be our song. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.